Good morning, colleagues. On behalf of the Director General, the Ministry of the Public Service, I welcome you to today's webinar entitled Understanding Misconduct. My name is Michael Clark. I'm a Human Resource Officer here with the Learning Development Directorate, the Ministry of the Public Service. And today I will be your moderator as we explore today's topic, as I just said, Understanding Misconduct. Now, as many of you are aware, we do enjoy hearing from you and we would like to include your voice in the conversation. But before we get there, here are some rules of engagement that we wish to share with you. Um, first, I'm gonna ask you all to mute your microphones. Um, this significantly helps reduce distractions so people can stay focused on the presentation. Also disable your video. I'm gonna ask you to pause and minimize any distractions as much as possible. If this is unavoidable, then at least make sure that your mic is new, as I said before. I need you all to focus fully on the presentation. It's gonna be a heavy topic today with loads of information that I'm sure you all will find relevant. So kindly stay focused. Um, we're gonna ask you to share what you have learned in the chat. Um, we'd also like you to reflect on your own experiences. And most of all, we want you to participate in the activities that, are, that accompany the webinar. Now, this session promises to be very informative and there's a time allotted for a question and answer segment. You will be, therefore be given an opportunity to use the chat box to share your comments and our team will be monitoring the chat space to share your questions and comments with the facilitator. It is at this point, I would like to introduce you to our presenter for this webinar, Mrs. Kim Butcher. Mrs. Butcher is the Acting Principal Crown Council here at the Ministry of the Public Service. So Mrs. Butcher, I'll be handing over to you now. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Michael. Um, good morning, colleagues. Welcome to our presentation on understanding misconduct. I hope that at the end of the session that you would be able to better understand the procedures as outlined in the Public Service Act. The topics that we will discuss today will be the types of misconduct that con the types of conduct that constitutes misconduct of a serious and minor nature, the penalties applicable to misconduct of a serious and minor nature, and the procedure for dealing with misconduct of a serious and minor nature. At the end of the presentation, I believe that you will have a better understanding of what constitutes offenses under the Public Service Act and how they are classified. And I believe that you would also have gained an increased awareness of the penalties that are applied to these offenses. So let's jump right into it. There are two types of misconduct in the public service. There is misconduct of a minor nature, and this is conduct that does not warrant the dismissal of the offending officer. There is also misconduct of a serious nature, and this type of conduct warrants the dismissal of the offending officer. As we go through the presentation, you would see that it does not mean that an officer will be dismissed, but we know that that type of misconduct can potentially warrant the dismissal of the officer. Under the Code of Conduct and Ethics that is outlined in the second schedule to the Public Service Act and the Code of Discipline, which is outlined in the third schedule to the Public Service Act, you will find all actions that can amount to misconduct of a minor nature. They're outlined at paragraph 27B2 of the Code of Conduct and Ethics and paragraph two of the Code of Discipline. One of the first actions that can amount to misconduct of a minor nature, this is misconduct that does not warrant the dismissal of the offending officer, um, is punctuality. Paragraph 14.2 says that officers shall attend work punctually and a habitual lateness is a breach of the code. We know that in this current environment that we have flexi work arrangements. Um, so uh, officers should not mind if they are um, coming in later because they're obviously they are leaving later. You may be coming in earlier and leaving earlier. Whether it's a flexi work arrangement or the normal 
um, course of attendance in the public service, that's 8.15, uh, with a 15 minute grace period to 8.30 to 4.30. If you are punctual, you would not be in breach of the code, but if you are late habitually, so this, again, the keyword is habitually, it doesn't mean lateness once or twice a week, but if you're habitually late, that then that can amount to a breach of the code. Officers are also not permitted to undertake paid employment without the permission of the relevant service commission. That's outlined at paragraph 19.1. The relevant service commissions, each officer would know which commission they're under. If you're part of the protective services, then you're under the protective service commission. Then there is the judicial and legal service commission, which deals with all judicial um, and legal officers in the government of Barbados. And then everyone else is under the administrative general and professional service commission. If you intend to undertake paid employment, you have to get the permission of your service commission. Generally, this is um, persons in a professional category usually ask for permission for paid employment, private paid employment, um, lawyers, doctors, nurses, um, engineers, land surveyors um, may ask for permission to work, um, to be employed privately. I don't remember if I said teachers, but teachers usually have lessons um, during the school term and on weekends, they can ask for permission. And um, it can um, go as far as if you are, ha if you have a shop at home, or if you sell things on your site, that you should ask for permission to work privately. Um, the general orders at paragraph, at order 3.8.1 um, also states that a person, if you undertake private work or if you are engaged in any commercial or agricultural undertaking, that you should get the consent of your service commission to do so. Another misconduct of a minor nature is the use of abusive, insulting or obscene language while you're on duty. Most often when people think about this type of behavior, they think about it in a work context, in an office context, sorry. Um, but this also applies to few officers, officers who work in depots, people who are out on the job somewhere on the road and they're doing the work for the government during government hours, that is while you're on duty, that you are not supposed to engage in abusive or insulting language. This also um, persons who are who work night shifts, guards or whoever else that may work on night shift, you're also not to engage in any language that is seen as obscene, abusive or insulting while you're on duty. Malingering on duty is also considered a misconduct of a minor nature. Malingering is feigning injury or sickness, pretending that you are hurt just to simply avoid work um, or to avoid going to a meeting or anything, avoid doing something that a supervisor or manager may ask you to do that you don't agree with. But instead of saying, I don't agree with it, you decided that you're not feeling well, so you're going to ask to go home early. Um, so malingering amongst the misconduct of a minor nature. There's also failing to maintain official records. Failing to maintain official records is very far and wide. Um, it can start with things like writing minutes on files, ensuring that every time you interact with a file, or like here in the case of the Ministry of the Public Service, we interact with files for a whole set of reasons. We can interact with a file because a person is due their pension. We can interact with a file because a person is um, being disciplined. We can interact with a file because a head of department can request um, the creation of a temporary post. Um, there are loads of reasons. It could be that a person wants to inform the commission that they would like to um, have permission to work privately. Again, we will be interacting with a file. Sometimes you are not only interacting with the file by sending a minute, sometimes you may take a telephone call it is essential that you put minutes to reflect what is happening on a daily basis on the file so that another officer can take up the file and continue action on it. You are supposed to maintain official records. 
at all levels, whether it's that you're working on a file, whether you are in a personnel section and you are responsible for maintaining the attendance record, whether um, it is failing to file documentation in a particular order, depending on the policy of your department. And as I said, it really depends on the department because um, official records can range from paper records to um, soft copy records. So whatever it is, once it's a record of the government, you are to maintain it. And failure to maintain the record can amount to a misconduct of a minor nature. There is damage to property of the Crown. Um, this is one of the types of misconduct that falls under misconduct of a minor nature and misconduct of a serious nature. It would depend on the extent of the damage, whether it would be deemed misconduct of a minor nature or a serious nature. This damage to property of the Crown can involve anything. Anything that belongs to the Crown that was damaged by you um, can amount to a misconduct of a minor nature. Misuse of the internet and the internet. Um, if, if you follow international news, and I think even regionally something happened, I can't remember the full details of the, um, of the case, but I think it was Guyana that two or three persons had to pay out large sums of money to another lady because they sent stuff about her via WhatsApp. Um, so similarly, if there's a misuse of the government's internet or the internet while you are at work, using the internet for certain reasons that um, does not amount to government business, or if there's a misuse of the internet that is shared internally, then that can amount to misconduct of a minor nature. And then there is disorderly conduct. Disorderly conduct is broad and obviously it's subjective. So the head of department or the permanent secretary who are the investigating officers under the Public Service Act, under the Code of Discipline, will determine what they believe is disorderly conduct. But if conduct, whether it's fighting, whether it's quarreling, whatever it may be, if they deem it disorderly conduct, then it can amount to a misconduct of a minor nature. So now we have discussed the, um, what amounts to misconduct of a minor nature. Let us look at the penalties involved. Paragraph 92 of the Code of Discipline outlines the penalties that can be imposed on an officer who is found guilty of misconduct of a minor nature. And the penalties that can be imposed are an oral warning or a reprimand in writing. That is the extent of what can be imposed on an officer guilty of misconduct of a minor nature. Um, if we have any heads of departments or permanent secretaries um, on, on, in this webinar, um, is instructive to note that even though you are issuing an oral warning, that it should be reflected on the file that an oral warning was issued to the officer because of their behavior. And also that you should become familiar with what is written in the code of discipline about the procedure for dealing with misconduct of a minor nature, um, which includes having an officer who is um, at a higher grade than the officer who is being investigated, conduct an investigation, and, and then um, presenting their findings to the, to the um, permanent secretary, and then um, submitting that information to the director general. All of that information is outlined at paragraph five of the Code of Discipline, um, entitled Adjudication of of, of minor offenses. Whatever is done must be documented and well documented. And I will tell you why, because we will discuss that at the end of misconduct of a serious nature. So that is, that is what is involved in misconduct of a minor nature. Let's turn our attentions now to misconduct of a serious nature. Remember that misconduct of a serious nature is conduct that warrants the dismissal of the offending officer. Misconduct of a serious nature. Um, the acts that amount to misconduct of a serious nature are outlined at paragraph 27B1 
of the Code of Discipline, the Code of Conduct and Ethics, sorry, and paragraph two of the Code of Discipline. Paragraph 5C of the Code of Conduct and Ethics says that officers shall not deceive or knowingly mislead ministers, parliament, permanent secretaries, or the public. I will mention this again in relation to another act of misconduct, but why this is important is because sometimes you just have to know the society that you are in. And we are a society where people can be, um, people can, there, there's party politics, people can align themselves with a particular party. But when you are a public officer, you have to put party politics aside and the information that you provide to your ministers, the parliament, to permanent secretaries must not be done to deceive or mislead. And similarly, persons who work in an environment where they interact with, with the public, they can, they can be dismissed potentially from the public service or have one of the penalties for misconduct of a serious nature imposed if they deceive or knowingly mislead a member of the public. Um, this particular provision is uh, aiming at making sure that there is integrity and that the quality of advice provided to those who lead us and to the members of the public that we service is um, good and is correct. Misuse of public funds. Paragraph 72 of the Code of Conduct and Ethics says that officials shall not appropriate or use public funds in contravention of this act, which is the Public Service Act or any other law. Um, it is important to note, I think, especially for persons in like the accounting field or whatever field that you may be in, in, in um, government, but especially those in, in the accounting field, to know the financial regulations, to know all of them, the Financial Management Act, um, the rules associated with, um, with, the, with finances, because public funds, as we know, we go through the budget on a yearly basis and money is allocated in votes for a particular reason. There is within the rules of that governs finance in the public service information about how to move money from one budget to the other and to the extent that you can do that. I'm not a financial controller, so I don't um, know the procedure um, by heart, but I know that it's there there are things that govern how you move money from one vote to another. Where you want to do that, you need to follow the rules so that you don't find yourself in problems committing a misconduct of a serious nature. Know the rules that govern finances to ensure that you do not fall into that. And also public funds are not for personal use. You cannot decide if you're a cashier that you want something from the um, vending machine and you ask someone, you take $5 out of the till and ask someone to run and buy something for you with the intention that you're going to put it back. Public funds should not be appropriated at all. They should not be used for any reason other than from the, for the allocation of votes in the yearly budget. Then there's conflict of interest. Conflict of interest can arise if you misuse your official position or information acquired in the course of your official duties to further your own private interests or the private interests of others. It can also arise if you receive benefits of any kind from a third party that might reasonably be seen to compromise um, your personal judgment or your integrity. Let's deal with the first part of conflict of interest. I'm going to try to think of a, a Example, a good example would be um, if you work here at the Ministry of the Public Service and you have information on what is going to take place in the interview, you know that it would not just be, sorry, what will take place for the whole um, recruitment process. It may not be limited to interview. You may be asked to do a test. If you have the test and you have the answers to the test, that is information that you would have gained during the course of your official duties. And then you have no right to pass that information on to someone else for their benefit or for your own benefit. You can't 
you can't make contact with a friend and and um or or utilize information that you receive while doing your job in order to help um to help yourself and then receive benefits of any kind there was a time that i presented this um webinar and persons outlined that there are gifts that in some departments like the post office that if you work in a district post office if that's the right term to use that someone may walk for a mile or so with cane on their heads uh, on well head someone will walk with cane on their heads and they will present it to the staff at the post office or something something from their garden um, and that they did not see that this fall under this particular section. Um, whether or not it is, I think will be dependent on who is the um, investigating officer, but suffice it to say that you're not supposed to accept benefits of any kind. Maybe um, it can be argued that this particular section does not necessarily take into consideration the culture that we live in, but it is written. <laughs> You're not supposed to take benefits of any kind from a third party, especially if it has the potential to question your um, integrity. And then there is, um, as it relates to misconducts of a serious nature, disclosing of information. Officers should not without authority disclose official information that has been communicated to them in confidence within the ministry or department or receive in confidence from another. And we, we know when information is official. There are some of us like myself, because of the nature of my job, I had to sign the oath of secrecy. And there are other persons who may not have to sign the oath of secrecy, but you know based on the nature of the information that will pass your desk that it is confidential information. You don't need someone to tell you that it is confidential information. If that happens, you cannot communicate it um, without authority. You can't communicate it to the newspaper. You can't even communicate it to your spouse. There are things that touches my desk that I will never discuss with my husband because I understand the nature of the information that, that it is. Um, officers, we've discussed this one, but it is also, this is one of those things that's a misconduct of a minor nature and a serious nature. Officers shall maintain official records. Um, where failure to do so will amount to a grave injustice or as required by this act or regulation made there under. Um, we discussed that generally as it relates to files, but then there are times that your failure to record information can amount to a grave injustice. Imagine if you found yourself um, so overwhelmed with work that you did not process a person's, that you did not process a person's um, pension or whatever information may amount to um, whatever information that you're working with that you know, if I don't action this, it can amount to a grave injustice. That can amount to misconduct of a serious nature. And then there is improper behavior. Um, it says that an officer um, shall report to his head of department or where the matter involves the head of department, the head of the public service, evidence of criminal or unlawful activities or instances of, of breaches of this code. Officers are required when they see criminal activity, where they see unlawful activity or where they see a breach of the code. It's instructive that they, they say the head of the public service because if you believe that it is your head of department, whether that is a department head or, or a permanent secretary. If you believe that the unlawful or criminal behavior or breaches to the code is coming from your head, then you need to report it to the head of the public service. Um, it says shall, I believe is section 37 of the Interpretation Act that defines what shall is, shall is it, it places an obligation on you. It's mandatory. It does not allow you to have a discretion. You cannot sit back and decide, well, will I report it or will I not report it? It places an obligation on all public officers to be mindful of the activities that are happening around them. And when you see evidence of um, criminal, unlawful or activities or breaches of the act, you're supposed to report it. 
And I will say to you that we have had, and we continue to have, we actually have a few cases. I think there are about five persons um, that we are in the process of um, setting up a disciplinary hearing for officers who were aware of something that happened to a, a, a client and they saw it and it was not reported. By the time it was reported and an investigation took place, there were other officers who ought to have reported the incident but did not report the incident and then fall under this particular paragraph having breached paragraph 11.2. And now they are a part of a disciplinary hearing for misconduct of a serious nature for failing to report a particular activity and the activity was very egregious. So um, there is a requirement on all of us to be mindful and to maintain certain standards in the public service and to report activities that are unlawful or to report breaches of the act. Then there are officers who are absent from duty without permission. If you're absent from duty without permission, um, unless your permanent secretary or head of department um, believe that it's due to illness or an unavoidable circumstance, um, then you are in breach of the code. Obviously, all of that will come out in the wash as an investigation takes place. A permanent secretary or head of department may conclude, oh, that this was a, a, a absence that was due to illness and because of the nature of the illness, the officer was not able to submit something on time. Um, but that comes out as, in, as an investigation takes um, place. But if it is found out that you were absent from duty without permission, then it amounts to a misconduct of a serious nature. And heads of department and permanent secretaries, permanent secretaries can deduct your pay to the extent of your absence. This is not something that they need to come to the commissions for. It is a power given to permanent secretaries and heads of department that they can deduct pay according to the absence of the particular officer. I think I moved it too far. Just give me a second. Let me find back where I am. Okay. And then there is improper dress. Um, paragraph 17.1 um, require officers to dress soberly, neatly, and tidily in accordance with the requirement of the job, having regard to the desirability of maintaining standards of attire consistent with the dignity of the public service. You will see from the terms um, and, the, and the, the use of language in the Public Service Act that the intention is to basically up the standard of the service that we are a part of. Um, what is deemed appropriate dress is subject to the head of department, paragraph 72, 17, two states that it is subject to the head of the department um, with the, the permanent secretary with the head of department. Um, they can use their discretion to determine what is soberly dressed. Obviously, it is not expected that a person who is a land surveyor or a chairman will come to work dress as if they are a permanent secretary and, and vice versa. It's not expected that a permanent secretary will come to work um, dress as if they are um, a, what other type of job? I can't even think, but a chairman or a engineer or something of the sort. Your dress is dependent on the type of job that you're in, the standard for what is considered sober, neat and tidily is dependent on your, the head of that particular department. This particular section is important to note. Paragraph 21 says that if an officer has been convicted of a criminal offense um, or who is guilty of misconduct of a serious nature, sorry. Yes, if you are convicted of a criminal offense or if you were found guilty of misconduct of a serious nature while holding public office, you are liable to be dismissed. 
Why this section is important is because there is a provision in the Code of Discipline that says that if an officer has been charged, not convicted, if they have been charged with a criminal offense, that you can still have a disciplinary hearing at the same time. However, if an officer has been convicted of a criminal offense, this section is important because it does not require a disciplinary hearing to take place. The commission, the, the particular service commission who is responsible for that officer can ask for this officer to be removed from the public service under paragraph 21 um, as a result of that criminal conviction. Also, officers who fail to disclose to the recruiting authorities that they um, have a criminal conviction that they had prior to employment in the public service could be dismissed. So where it is asked, if you had a criminal conviction, you are supposed to say, yes, I had a criminal conviction. Where you say, no, I did not have a criminal conviction, and it has been found out that you did, then that person is liable to be dismissed um, from the service. Sexual harassment is also misconduct of a serious nature. Um, sexual harassment includes any unwelcome behavior, sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, um, oral or physical conduct. Um, I believe that sexual harassment is something like, like racism. You know someone is treating you a particular way, you may not be able to proper, properly describe it, but there is a discomfort that you have when you're being treated a particular way. If you believe that the behavior that another officer is extending to you amongst the sexual harassment, then it should be reported. And the officer who is doing that behavior um, could be found guilty of misconduct of a serious nature. You must know that in relation to the Public Service Act, sexual harassment is not gender specific. It can be man to woman, woman to man, man to man, or woman to woman sexual harassment can take place under the Public Service Act from any officer to another officer. Um, I will caution people because in a Barbadian context, we're very liberal with our mouths. We're very liberal as we um, speak to another person, the type the terms of endearment that we may use to other officers. We're very liberal in expressing what we think about a person who may be very shapely and how they look in their clothes on a particular day. And so be mindful that as society evolves, certain behaviors that might have been cultural may amount to sexual harassment. And then there is the use of the media. The public, the code of conduct and ethics outlines a host of behaviors that can amount to misconduct of a serious nature when you are interacting with the media. It says that um, you are not allowed to be, public officers are not allowed to be editors of any newspapers or directly or indirectly um, involved in the management of a newspaper. You're not allowed to contribute to any newspaper or um, on questions that can be called political or administrative. You may be able to write on articles of a general nature. But if, if what you write can be deemed political or administrative, it can amount to misconduct of a serious nature. You're not allowed to make statements to the media or allow yourself to be interviewed or questioned on public policy or matters affecting the defense, um, military resources or diplomatic relations. You can only if you got approval from your minister Outside of approval from your minister, you're not supposed to make certain statements to the media. You're not allowed to make public or communicate to the media or cause to be made public or to be communicated to the media um, or to an unauthorized person, any documents, papers, or information which comes into your possession in your official capacity or make copies of these documents. I will say that when I first came to the Ministry of Public Service years ago, that I actually um, read a file where a case like this was done, where something was 
publish in a newspaper. And as a result, the officer was um, disciplined under the act. You're not supposed to give broadcast talks or engage in any discussion that is being broadcasted on any subject that may properly be regarded as political or administrative, again, without permission from your minister. And you're not supposed to disclose or produce in evidence any official document of a confidential nature in any court of law without obtaining permission from your minister. So that's a lot to swallow, but I hope that I was able to, um, I, I did not go through it too quickly, but it is all written in the Public Service Act and it's easy to find. And then there are another set of actions that, mis that amount to misconduct of a serious nature that are outlined in the Code of Discipline. Again, absence from duty without leave or approval constitutes a misconduct of a serious nature. That is one that you can also find in the Code of Conduct and Ethics. Conviction of a criminal offense, punishable by a term of imprisonment. So that means that if you were um, convicted on a summary offense, that is an offense that you don't spend prison time for, that um, that does not amount in di on, for this particular um, paragraph, subparagraph, um, to a term of imprisonment. It will be a criminal conviction, but not under this particular subparagraph. These will be things like murder, theft, grievous bodily harm, rape, any particular conviction that you can spend time in prison for. Um, or failure to report or disclose any information that ought reasonably to be reported or disclosed where the consequence of that failure amounts to grave injustice. And we would have discussed this earlier. You know, this sometimes can happen to officers where they receive, for example, it's not the only one, I'm sure that there are loads of other examples that you can come up with. But in terms of discipline, an officer can receive an, an oral instruction, even though supervisor is supposed to write something, write their instructions, an officer may receive an oral instruction, act, act on that oral instruction and find themselves in trouble. And another officer would have seen and known that this is a grave injustice, that their, that their colleague is being disciplined or, or being treated a particular way as a result of an oral instruction and that officer ought to report that um, they have information that if they don't report it, it can amount to a grave injustice. That's just an example from a disciplinary perspective, but I'm sure that there are loads of other examples or, or, or things that you know that might have happened in the service that will amount to um, a person suffering a grave injustice because information was not reported. There is also insubordination. Insubordination amounts to misconduct of a serious nature. Um, there is habitual intoxication or possession or use of illegal drugs while on duty. And then there is reporting to duty while under the influence of alcohol or illegal drugs. They all amount to misconduct of a serious nature. Failure to observe any laws, orders, rules, or regulations governing the public service is a misconduct of a serious nature. Falsification of accounts or records, either manually or electronically, is a misconduct of a serious nature. Um, or the willful alteration, man, um, mutilation, or destruction of property, including official documents or records, again, either manually or electronically, is a misconduct of a serious nature. Um, an example of a falsification of records, and this is a simple one. Obviously, there are serious, there are times where people can actually go into a system and change records. And that will be a major um, issue, especially based on the implications of the action. But something minor that people don't think about, using the attendance record on Mondays and putting a 30 for Monday straight to Friday and 430 from Monday to Friday. Um, that would be false. That would amount to falsi falsification of records. Um, that would obviously be in, in manually 
but then there is changing information, writing minutes, for example, if you're responsible for minute writing and changing the information um, inside simply because you have, you have access to the document, so you change it to, to look a particular way. Um, there is um, instructions, we've had, we've had a matter before where a supervisor instructed an officer to go into SmartStream and change information, it was an oral instruction, and it amounted to um, the alteration of a record that can amount to misconduct of a serious nature. And there's also the threatening of um, other officers um, or threatening the destruction of property while you're on duty that can amount to misconduct of a serious nature. Um, the causing of grievous bodily harm is misconduct of a serious nature. Do note that grievous bodily harm has a particular definition in law. Um, and usually it has to be something that is very serious, um, not a mere injury. The unauthorized possession of a firearm or any device that can be considered offensive or the acceptance of bribes or any type of inducements. Again, in, in our society, there are certain actions that we have engaged in over the years that we really must sit back and consider, can this be deemed a bribe? Uh, uh, if, if someone else look at this particular action, would they say that I'm being bribed? And then as written prior, misappropriation of public funds. Major loss or damage to property is a misconduct of a serious nature. Um, and that can be, as we have here in the image, it can amount to damage to a public um, vehicle, an MP vehicle. Um, it can amount to damage to a computer or anything, anything that is government property. If there is major loss or damage, it's a misconduct of a serious nature. And you can even be asked to um, repay or pay for the repair or the replacement of the particular item. Um, failure to perform duties assigned is also a misconduct of a serious nature. And this can stem from supervisors to, um, to staff. It can be deemed that your failure to perform duties is a misconduct of a serious nature. And as it relates to those who are um, like PSs and heads of departments, there are particular um, powers that commissions have in order to discipline people at that level. If they fail to provide them with information that they have required, um, and then there are other people who simply because they don't like the particular task or don't like working with a particular officer that they refuse to perform a particular duty. And there have been instances um, one of my experiences, one of the cases that I would have heard before where a supervisor was charged, the supervisor um, was not the person who did the particular action, the particular action that was a serious action. Um, the supervisor was not the person who did the action, notwithstanding the person could not have done that action if the supervisor was doing their job. And that supervisor was charged and a penalty imposed on that person as a result of the failure to, to supervise. And again, failure to maintain official records where the consequence amounts to a grave injustice. And finally, misconduct involving three or more um, actions of a minor nature within a two year period. And I would have said before that it's necessary that when you are the investigating officer for misconduct of a minor nature, that the information is documented, that the penalty imposed on the officer is documented, and that that information is communicated to the director general. Because the only way that an officer can be deemed, that's okay, <laughs> the only way that an officer can be deemed to have conducted misconduct of a serious nature three times or more within two years is because it was documented. If you fail to document, there is no convincing anyone at the Ministry of the Public Service that this officer did in fact do this particular action and now it amounts to misconduct of a serious nature. What are the penalties that can be imposed on an officer who 
breaches, um, who has been found guilty, sorry, of misconduct of a serious nature. You can have suspension on half pay for a period not in excess of six months. You can have a reduction in rank or suspension of future increments for a period not exceeding two years. So as you know, there are some people who, as this picture is suggesting, there are some people who may be working from Z18 to Z12, and then you would have got, got your first increment after the first year, your second increment after the second year, your third increment, and then a penalty is imposed on you because of a misconduct of a serious nature and you fail to receive your next two increments. When that penalty has been, um, what's the correct word? When, when you would have, when the penalty would have expired, the two years would have expired, you don't then jump to where you should have been. You now have to go through the Z15 to 14 and the Z14 to 13. You don't automatically jump to the higher one. You can also have a reprimand in writing. You can have compulsory retirement. They can ask you, they can say, okay, it's time for you to go. And instead of us sending you, it is best that you retire from the public service. And the most um, grave, the gravest penalty of all is dismissal from the service. This penalty is not simply um, that you have lost your job, for officers who are older, this penalty has certain implications because as you know, when you are dismissed from the public service, um, you may, the governor general has the discretion to determine whether or not you will be dismissed with part of your pension or no pension at all. And so that's the gravest penalty. It has serious implications for officers who would have spent many years in the public service and, um, and either commit a misconduct of a serious nature knowingly or might have become disillusioned because of particular actions or things that might have happened to them in the surface and find themselves in a position like this. So that is, um, I think of all the penalties, the harshest penalty, and it has been applied on more than one occasion to officers um, arising out of disciplinary hearings here at the ministry. And now I open up for any questions or any clarifications that you may need. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, I would like to thank you for taking the time to be our presenter this morning. Um, we did have several questions appearing in the chat and I'd ask participants also to continue to place their um, questions in the chat so we can share them with Mrs. Butcher, and she'll offer some further insight. Um, Kim, one of the questions we received was, what about self-employment on the side? This is with reference to persons undertaking or engaging in private work. Yes, all forms of employment on the side um, should be communicated to your commission and asked for permission. Um, I believe that the intention of that in the legislation is to make sure that you're not engaging in anything that may be a conflict of interest that will cause um, problems of integrity and um, for the service. So no matter what it is, as I said, if you look at the general orders, it goes as far as even to say if you are engaging in an agricultural undertaking. Um, so they have pretty much covered all their bases. Whatever you do, where you are making money outside of what you're being paid, um, you should ask for permission to do it. And I can say that I have seen files where people um, receive permission. I did a presentation a few years ago. I think it was to teachers and they would have said, they, um, that, um, you know, they don't believe that you would get permission. But I have seen files where people receive permission. Okay, thank you. Um, you have another question here is in relation to um, oral warnings. And they're asking, is it necessary to have a witness when doing oral warnings or when given an officer oral warning? Um, I believe that each department should have, uh, the heads of a department should have something in place um, and that it should 
uh, be agreed on. I personally um, would prefer when you are having discussions of this nature to involve HR um, so that everyone, you have witnesses and that when the information is placed on file and the officer is aware that the information is being placed on file that they cannot then um, come back and say, no, it didn't happen. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question here from Shirley Aline and she's, she's asking, suppose two people were in a relationship and they had a fallout and one wants to get back at the other and cry sexual harassment, what happens here? Um, well, that, that is true. That can potentially happen in the workplace or that can happen in the, um, in the real world. Um, if I, I don't know who Shirley Allen is, everyone, just for the record, but if I did not like Shirley Allen and I decided to say that she sexually harassed me and I didn't go to the public service act and I went to the, to the um, criminal courts, chances are she would be arrested right away and then they start their investigation while she's waiting um, to have her first court appearance to plead guilty or not guilty. And then the court will decide at that stage, am I going to put her on remand or am I going to um, offer her bail? And so similarly, if a person makes an accusation like that in the public sector, until you do the investigation. So there are two stages. There, there's the investigation internally where the PS or the head of department or um, their deputies, because the, um, the interpretation act says that the powers of a head are the powers of a deputy. So if any of those persons um, conduct an investigation and they recognize that they do not have any evidence to submit to the Ministry of Public Service to show that harassment takes place, then you would have to say there is no harassment. If they have found evidence and they have submitted sufficient evidence, and then myself um, or um, Marissa Eswick, who prosecute the cases on behalf of the commission, um, if there's sufficient evidence and we present that evidence to the investigatory panel, then again, it's still up to them to determine if the evidence reached the standard of proof that is required. But the reality is that will be hanging over the officer's head until the determination has been made by the investigating officer in the, um, in the ministry or here at MPS, if it gets that far. Really, thank you very much. I hope that cleared up that question for Mrs. Aline and the other participants. Um, we have a question here again. Is the minister the one to give permission to speak to the press? Yes, that's what it says um, in the in the legislation. Let me pull it up directly from. Yes. So there are times where they say you shall not. And, and it's paragraph 24, if you wanted to go and look at it yourself. There are times when you say you shall not. And there are times where it says you can, but only with approval from the minister. So 24C and E and F requires you to have permission from your minister. And the other ones simply say that you shall not. So it is only the minister. Um, there are certain rules of um, drafting that suggest that certain powers are uh, can be delegated, and then there are other, and that some other powers cannot be. That that now is a legal question um, that I don't intend to get into at this stage. <laughs> but notwithstanding, as written, it says it is the minister. Okay, thank you very much. Simple, straightforward answer. Um, I have a question coming in. Some forms of, of misconduct are at the discretion of the permanent secretary. What is your redress if you feel the action is unjustified or unwarranted? Um, well, I'm not sure what the first part of that question means. Uh, most, a lot of them are subjective really, uh, if that's what the person means. But remember, an investigation still has to take place internally if it's a misconduct of a serious nature. If a mis well, whether it's a misconduct of a serious nature or minor nature, an investigation still has to take place to determine if in fact something did happen. And then if it's a serious nature, it comes over to us to actually go through a hearing. Um, however, 
there are instances, there is another quote. Let me look for you. There's another quote, the fourth schedule of the Public Service Act deals with grievance, the grievance handling procedure. And where an officer has a grievance, it is advised that they go through that quote. However, if it is something in relation to discipline, I would think that you would want to just go through the process to make a determination as to your innocence or your guilt. I hope I have answered the question. If not, let me know. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Um, can a minister, can a minister of government or parliamentary, parliamentary secretary or chairman of boards be involved in the investigation of discipline? The Public Service Act says the code of conduct or ethics defines at paragraph um, four nineteen. It says who an authorized officer is, and the authorized officer at paragraph four four, I think it is, four two, is the person who's responsible for doing the investigation. And the authorized officer is defined. It says it means the permanent secretary, um, head of department, or an officer of the same grade as the permanent secretary. So those are the persons who are responsible for investigating a misconduct of a serious nature. Unless, of course, if the permanent secretary is involved, then the commission will select an officer of a similar grade to do it. And involved doesn't, uh, involved means directly involved in not that it is the permanent secretary who is the person who caused the actions, um, who like gave an instruction and it amounted to misconduct of a serious nature. But if it's action, if it's insubordination towards the PS, then the PS is involved in that sense. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, there's a question about the abuse of um, power by executives, obviously persons in charge. Um, and the participant is wondering how can something like this be reported or managed properly? Right. Um... Well, that, that, I guess, but the head of the public service, normally, um, as it relates to discipline, if there is actions, I think I would have mentioned that, if you believe that action of your head of department, RPS. We're not on you too. Hello? hello? Carry on, Kim. That was just a participant. Okay. Probably was accidentally omitted. Okay. Um, if a head of department or permanent secretary is involved in a particular action, the, the law says it should be reported to the head um, of department. Um, obviously, there's no piece of legislation that is perfect. Legislation was created by man. And so sometimes it will require going through the process, um, just like a criminal matter, to show that you are innocent if you believe that a person is um, abusing their powers. Okay, All right. thank you very much, Kim. Um, I think I'm going to probably just give you one more question, seeing that we are running out of time. For those unanswered questions, we will probably compile that and try to produce a document which we can forward to the um, participants of the webinar. Okay. Um, there's a question here. Is there a maximum time for a temporary officer to be on suspension before a decision on their misconduct is reached? On suspension, okay. So the uh, there are two there are two things. Um, so so to ensure that a person understands um, the difference be between the two things, there is interdiction, and then there is suspension. As it relates to suspension, an officer can be suspended. Let me get it right. An officer can be suspect. I do not believe that there's a timeline on the suspension of an officer when an investigation is taking place. Nor is there a timeline for the conclusion of an investigation. There's a timeline by which an investigation needs to start. Um, but there is no timeline for the suspension, notwithstanding when it has been, when it has been agreed that the officer 
um, committed misconduct of a serious nature, then the officer goes on interdiction and interdiction um, is for a period not exceeding six months. Obviously, an interdiction can be extended, but when, the in, when interdiction has been extended, the officer goes back on pay. When an officer is on interdiction, they are on half pay. But interdiction takes place at the point in time where an officer has been deemed to commit a misconduct of a serious nature, and they would have received their package from here from us, and we would now begin to um, basically communicate to them what, needs, what they need to know and the dates that we're looking at to have the, the, um, the first hearing. And then they automatically go from suspension to interdiction. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Butcher. I hope um, that answer would suffice to the participant. And like I said before, um, we will attempt to answer your questions and prepare a document where you can go back and review the answer to these questions. Um, I would also like now for you to take part in a simple yes or no poll, which will appear on your screen shortly. Um, Kim, could you advance the slide for me, please? Yes, and sorry. the question is, do you have a better understanding of what behaviors are classified as offensive of both serious and minor nature and the associated penalties? my moderator, Ms. <laughs> Joanne Jordan, to comment on the feedback we've gotten so far? Well, all of our participants indicated that they have a better understanding of what behaviors are classified as offenses of both a serious and a minor teacher. Okay, those so, are... 100%. <laughs> <laughs> those are excellent results, Joe, yeah? Yes, they are. Okay. Well, that's great, then. I'm glad. I'm glad that learning did take place in this activity. And um, as we prepare to wrap up, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and share with us what was your most valuable learning point today? Um, we would be very, very happy to hear your thoughts. Um, you can share this in the chat section. I'll probably share just a few before we move on to the thank you slide. Advance the slide for me, please, Kim. Sure. All right, so that's the question that I'm asking you to just post some comments in the chat. Also in the chat, I will be um, sharing with you a list of the offenses and we'll also be sharing a link to the public service app, which you can find on the Ministry of the Public Services website. So someone said what, what was most important for them was the discussion on the penalties, the associated penalties. Okay. Once again, penalties again. Clarification on interacting with the media. Yes, that was that was an interesting one. I also learned some stuff that I have never known before with regards to that. Penalties. So we, we do have various main learning points being taken away by different individuals. But the associated penalties seem to be the one being picked up more some by participants. Okay. So I leave the chat open so you can continue to post your comments. And then colleagues at this time, that's all we have for today. Um, the session went very quickly. Um, I did not even believe the time has expired as yet, but it has. So thank you all for being a part of our presentation this morning. You can visit our YouTube channel where you can view a recording of this webinar and any of our previous webinars. You simply go to youtube.com and in your search bar, you type in the Learning Development Directorate and your main result should be our, our um, YouTube channel. 
So you just click on that and you have a browse through our available videos. Once again, thank you for your attention, your attendance to our webinar and Mrs. Butcher, a wholehearted thanks to you for presenting. You're most welcome, Michael. Okay, cool. Wishing everyone a pleasant day and goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.